Welcome to the Loop Podcast, where we are transforming education and plastic surgery since 2020. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Loop Podcast. Today's episode is a resident and service review of chest wall reconstruction. This is a supplementary episode and not meant to be a comprehensive review. This is a breakdown of key points from previous examinations that may help if you are studying for boards or for the in-service exam. This is a fairly short episode, so let's get started. I have here with me Dr. Sanam Zahedi. She is one of our core hosts that has joined the Loop Committee. She is an integral part of this organization, and you will be hearing from her frequently on this channel. So that being said, Sanam, tell everyone about you and why you joined the Loop. Hi, everyone. I'm currently a second year independent plastic surgery resident at UC Davis, and I'm a board certified general surgeon and completed my general surgery residency at UTMB in Texas. I grew up in Iran and moved to Florida my junior year of high school and completed undergrad at University of Florida and med school at Florida State. So I claim Florida as my home state. My interests include breast reconstruction and cosmetic surgery. I'm excited to join as a co-host and bring some Persian flair to this group. Um, And I'm excited to work with this energetic and passionate Loop team to deliver an educational platform for residents and students. That's awesome. Thanks so much for joining and for spicing up this bunch with some (laughs) diversity. Okay, everyone, now let's move on to the content. We're talking about chest wall today. So the general causes of chest wall defects include trauma, infection, tumors, radiation, or even congenital defects. Let's break those down. So like Morgan said, those five categories, you have trauma that can include gunshot wounds, motor vehicle crashes, and so forth. Infection, such as post-sternotomy for cardiac surgery. Infectious rate in midline sternotomy is about 0.25 to 5%, with subsequent mortality of 50%. The next one is tumor, so that can include breast cancer, bone cancer, various uh, sarcomas. Radiation is another category. That's You can have that after breast cancer, lymphoma, and so forth. And the last category is congenital. That includes pectus excavatum, Poland syndrome, uh, et cetera. So what are the general reconstruction considerations, including soft tissue and or skeletal components for the following? So Morgan, what do we do for external soft tissue wound defects? So for soft tissue defects, first, you can think about back therapy. This can be used and is secondary intention. Next is regional flaps. Most commonly used is the pec muscle. Next is latissimus, then serratus anterior, and even the rectus abdominis. After this, microvascular free flaps. You can use these when regional options fail or are unavailable. And this includes the contralateral latissimus, ALT, or TFL. So large wounds greater than 10 centimeters may require omentum because the pec muscle is not large enough. If inferior to the sternum, consider using a VRAM for coverage. Okay, what if we have bony chest wall defects? So in a bony defect, you must address to avoid a flail chest. Anterior and posterior defects are typically better tolerated than lateral defects. Primary rigid sternal plate fixation in lieu of cerclage wires has better aesthetic outcomes and has also been shown to decrease complications from sternotomy closure. Skeletal reconstruction with alloplastic materials would be needed for defects greater than five centimeters or if there are more than four ribs involved, as this is more likely to result in a flail chest. So a flail chest, this means a paradoxical motion of the chest with loss of respiratory efficiency. So skeletal reconstruction can be accomplished with either autogenous or with alloplastic materials. So first, so autogenous, this includes rib grafts, fascia, or flaps. Alloplastic, so this includes synthetic mesh, such as polypropylene, like proline or Marlex, PTFE mesh or polyglactin, also bioprosthetic meshes such as ADM or xenograft. So also consider add-on composite methyl methacrylate for larger reconstruction to enhance chest wall stability. Now what should we know if a patient had prior radiation, let's say? So with a history of radiation, there's fibrosis of vascular structures and this limits the viability and mobility potential of the soft tissue. And what's so important about cardiopulmonary stability? So this is an especially important consideration as chest wall defects may limit the respiratory sufficiency if the defect is greater than five centimeters. So what flaps can be used for reconstruction? Well, you have your common ones, more common ones. That's the pec major, rectus abdominis, latissimus, serratus anterior. And then you have the lesser common ones, which are the external oblique, omentum, and perforator flaps. 
All right, let's break those down. First, let's talk about the pectoralis major flap. So this is the main choice for midline and sternal chest wall defects. It's a Mathis and a high type five. That means it has a dominant and a secondary pedicle. The dominant pedicle is the thoracoacromial artery. And the secondary is the internal mammary perforators and lateral thoracic artery. 6% of the time, the lateral thoracic is the dominant pedicle. So that translates into when you're doing head and neck reconstruction, you have decreased mobility if the lateral thoracic is left intact. And if you divide it in some cases, you might cause flap ischemia if it is actually the dominant one. So the pectoralis major can also be transferred as a turnover flap on its multiple segmental IMA perforators to fill midline sternal defects. And an important consideration for the pec major flap is that if you had prior surgery or radiation to the chest, it may compromise the pedicle viability. So donor site morbidity from the pectoralis major flap includes a large scar and also loss of the anterior axillary fold. And this is minimized by maintaining the superior humeral attachments of the pec major if possible. Next, let's talk about the rectus abdominis flap. That encompasses the VRAM or TRAM. This is superiorly based off of the superior epigastric vessels. It is a Mathis Nahai type 3 with two dominant pedicles, both the superior and the inferior epigastric artery. It is a very long muscle, so pubic symphysis up to the xiphoid and the fifth costal cartilages. And it's an excellent choice for anterior defects, especially the lower two thirds of the chest. And as you mentioned before, it can be used as a VRAM or a TRAM. VRAM meaning vertical rectus abdominis myocutaneous flap. It's the earliest rectus flap to be described. The pros are it's more straightforward to harvest. It's most robust vascularity of the rectus flaps. The cons are that you have a smaller skin paddle, you have a less aesthetically pleasing donor site, and you can potentially have an uneven donor scar or umbilicus. Next is TRAM. So this is the transverse rectus abdominis myocutaneous flap. And it's most commonly used for autologous postmastectomy breast reconstruction. Pros are that you can obtain a very large skin paddle and the scar can be hidden below the bikini line. And the cons are technically a little more difficult than the VRAM. And also there can be significant fat necrosis with this flap. One thing to remember is that if the chest wall injury is from a posterior lateral thoracotomy, then your latissimus flap is likely not gonna be useful, right? So you can consider using a VRAM for coverage. Next is the serratus anterior flap. And that's a Mathis in the high type three. It has two dominant pedicles. The first one is the lateral thoracic artery and the second one is a branch to the serratus from the subscapular artery. It's a fan-like muscle with multiple digitations that originate on the ribs and attach to the scapula. Therefore, given its location where it is, it's ideal for coverage of lateral chest wall defects. So the serratus anterior is less bulky than the latissimus dorsi flap, um, and it does offer some intrathoracic coverage. There is donor site morbidity because if you take the entire serratus muscle, it can cause a wing scapula. Let's talk about your back muscle, the latissimus dorsi flap. So this is a Mathis Nahai type five. It has a dominant and secondary pedicles. The dominant pedicle is the thoracodorsal artery, Secondary is perforators from the posterior intercostals and lumbar artery. Most commonly used for chest wall reconstruction and known for its bulk. And the thoracodorsal artery is highly reliable with little anatomic variability and multiple perforators allow customization of the skin island for many different types of defects of the chest wall. So what are the specific indications? Well, the first one's easy, right? The patient's not a candidate for tram flap. That's they, if they had prior surgery, like abdominal plasty, which rules them out. The second one is if a patient has a history of chest wall radiation, the latissimus flap is beneficial because you're bringing in new vascularized tissue that's outside the region of the radiation. Now, Morgan, what are the contraindications? So if the patient has had a posterior lateral thoracotomy, this could have compromised the thoracodorsal artery and they could have potentially cut through the latissimus muscle. Next is the external oblique muscle. And that's a Mathis in the high type five. It has a dominant and secondary pedicles. The dominant is the deep circumflex iliac artery, and the secondary is the fifth to 12 posterior intercostal arteries. This is an important time to talk about the difference between a type five and a type two muscle flap. Both have a dominant and secondary segmental perforators, 
But the difference is in a type five, flap can actually survive via the secondary pedicles if the dominant pedicle is compromised. You can't have that in a type two. The type two depends on the dominant pedicle. So this is much less commonly used in chest wall reconstruction due to a high donor site morbidity. So with this muscle, necrosis is common and there's also damage to intercostal nerves and this leaves the abdominal wall denervated. Next is a general surgery favorite, omental flap. The omental flap is a methosnahai type three. It has two dominant pedicles, the right and the left gastroepiploic arteries. It is less commonly used overall as a flap for chest reconstruction, but it can be used to fill defects anywhere, anterior, lateral, posterior chest wall, and the mediastinum. It's a particular use for a flap for larger defects, because as we know, the omentum is pretty big and it can be lengthened extensively or defects secondary to radiation necrosis is where it can be used. It's particularly useful in larger defects the momentum, as we know, is pretty big and it can be lengthened extensively. And also it can be used for, sec for defects secondary to radiation necrosis. The pro is it's a great flap because of its extensive blood supply and immunologic properties. The cons to this flap, so you must enter the peritoneal space to harvest. So you can do this either open or endoscopically, but it does risk damage to nearby structures in the abdomen. And if the patient has had a previous laparotomy, there could be multiple adhesions, limiting mobilization, and this could make it very difficult to harvest. So next is the thoracodorsal artery perforator flap or the Tdap flap. So you're waiting for me to tell you what math is in the high classification it is, right, Morgan? Well, trick question. It's not, you don't have a classification because it's a fascia cutaneous flap. There's no muscle. So the blood supply of this flap is perforators from the thoracodorsal artery, as the name suggests, and the harvest of this perforator flap is typically aided by intraoperative Doppler to localize those perforator vessels. Now let's move on to the intercostal artery perforator flap, IAP flap. This is also a fascia cutaneous flap, and it may utilize either anterior or lateral intercostal perforators. So the anterior intercostal perforator flap is supplied by more perforator vessels than the lateral intercostal perforator flap, thus providing more mobility and can be used for coverage in all four breast quadrants. But generally, so the anterior IAP can be used for medial quadrant defects and then the lateral IAP for the outer quadrant defects. Like Tdap flaps, the IAP is in general used to fill smaller irregularities such as touch up after primary reconstruction. Now let's move on to everyone's favorite topic, congenital defects. So pectus excavatum, Morgan, tell us all about it. So pectus excavatum, this occurs about one in 300 live births. It's believed to be the result of overgrowth of costal cartilages that subsequently forces the sternum posteriorly. The optimal repair is between the ages six and 12 years old or mid-adolescence, and usually it's the NUS procedure. Now, if you have an adult, or with reoccurrence after bar removal, then your option is to use a customized silicone elastomere implant in conjunction with augmentation mammoplasty to provide consistent and reliable correction of the pectus excavatum and breast age symmetry. So considerations for female patients, so deformity is largely due to thoracic concavity and not due to breast hypoplasia. Let's say you have a postpubertal female with residual chest concavity. It's best to feel the deformity with an implant rather than fat transfer because local adhesions make this technically difficult with very little benefit. And you don't wanna do additional bar correction because postpubertal reinsertion of a correction bar is reserved for really extreme cases. And the other option is augmentation mammoplasty for breast asymmetry if it's present. Let's talk about polymastia. So polymastia, which is accessory breasts, and polythelia, which is accessory nipples, they're both congenital anomalies that refer to an incomplete involution of the mammary ridge. Okay, and what is amastia? That's complete involution of the mammary ridge. Now let's move on to Poland syndrome. Everyone take note of this because there are always several questions on the in-service exam referring to Poland syndrome. So the incidence is one in 100,000. There's a male to female predilection of three to one and right side in males is two to one. It is hypoplasia of the breast and nipple. 
as well as absence of the sternocostal portion of the pectoralis major muscle, absence of the pectoralis minor muscle, and it can also involve anomalies of the upper extremity. These patients can also have absence of costal cartilages or multiple ribs. They can also have axillary webbing. Now the buzzword for the test, the pathognomonic feature, is that absence of the sternocostal head of the pectus major muscle. The etiology is likely subclavian artery supply disruption sequenced during sixth week of embryogenesis. And the primitive germ layer that is missing is the mesoderm, muscle layer, right? You're missing that sternal costal head of the pec major. So this is also associated with upper extremity anomalies, renal malformation, vertebral anomalies, and dextrocardia. These have all been described. But the most common associated feature being the upper extremity anomalies. And what you will see on the test is brachysyndactyly or short webbed fingers. So now what's the most common treatment for males and females? That's the latissimus muscle transfer. You also have to think about for females additional needs like using tissue expansion and then converting it to an implant. You can also use innervated ipsilateral latissimus to recreate the anterior axillary fold. Okay, what is tuberous breast deformity? That's a congenital hypoplastic breast with a constricted elevated base and a herniated nipple areola complex. Okay, so what is gynecomastia? That's a benign enlargement of the glandular breast tissue in a male. So the ideology is that you have an imbalance between your estrogen and your androgen. And what causes that is whatever causes you to have an abnormal increased ratio of estrogen, whether that's increased in estrogen or a decrease in androgen. So some of the things you can think about are transient imbalances that happen during puberty, or it can be secondary to medication uses or drugs, so marijuana, testicular pathology, thyroid disease, liver disease, and breast cancer. All right, drug use, and this can refer to luprolide or Lupron for prostate cancer. It is an agonist of pituitary GnRH receptors. It decreases testosterone, and because it decreases testosterone, it Increases breast size and also breast pain or mastodynia. You can give tamoxifen to decrease breast size or prevent this when using Lupron. One thing to remember is this is not to be confused with pseudogynecomastia. That's just fat deposition. It's not glandular tissue. So for diagnosis, you need a physical exam of the breast. You also need to check for testicular masses. You need to ask about drugs such as marijuana and also Lupron for the prostate cancer and also ask about recent weight gain. Now the grading system, there's four grades and they all have to do with regards to your hypertrophy of the breast and the ptosis. So grade one, you have minimal breast hypertrophy without ptosis. Grade two, you have moderate hypertrophy, still no ptosis. Grade three, it's severe hypertrophy with moderate ptosis. And grade four, there's severe hypertrophy with severe ptosis. Okay, treatment. So mild to moderate with no ptosis, you can just perform suction-assisted lipectomy, so liposuction. So if the patient has moderate hypertrophy with ptosis, consider performing direct periareolar excision with also additional skin excision. So if the patient has severe hypertrophy, think about doing a mastopexy type procedure with free dibble grafting. So basically the question is asking about what do you do with a very large amount of glandular tissue? The answer is you just directly excise it. So for pubertal gynecomastia, this usually resolves and you can observe it for at least the first six months. Also for treatment, you can use tamoxifen, but only if the gynecomastia has been present for less than a year. After one year, surgical treatment is needed. And one final important thing to mention with regards to the chest wall and wounds um, that we could be tested on on the test is regarding if you have radiation to the chest wall and an ulcer appears in chronic wounds, you should biopsy it to rule out sarcoma or a margillin ulcer. All right. Thank you, everyone. That was really quick and easy, by no means comprehensive, just a fast overview of what you are likely to see on the in-service exam related to chest wall reconstruction. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Loop. 